Welcome to the epic tale of Harry Potter and the quest for business value. I'm Stuart Mann. This is my obligatory introductory slide. Uh, I work for the largest bank in Africa, so African-based uh, bank called Standard Bank. Uh, I'm a compulsive marathon runner. I've completed 241 uh, marathons and ultras. Fortunately, since COVID struck, I haven't been able to uh, run any marathons. There'd be none on the go. So I used to be a lean agile coach these days. I've had to drop the lean for my job title, just an agile coach these days. I'm the father of two girls, a husband of one wife and a trainee feminist. That's not just a survival tactic at home. Uh, you will I do try and include strong female protagonists uh, in my conference talks. And you'll find that the hero of today's talk is in fact an eight-year-old girl called Alice. Um, I'm fortunate enough, I uh, do a bit of writing about running and um, so I'm a uh, sponsored shoes, uh, underpants and socks, uh, but my lifetime ambition is to secure a beer sponsor. It hasn't happened yet, uh, but you never know if you put it out there to the universe. Now I know that these uh, agile conferences, it's uh, always uh, uh, people like to kill misconceptions and generalizations. So being from South Africa, sometimes people wonder if we've got lions roaming around our streets. I can assure you, we definitely don't but I did once have a lion cub living at my house. So if you've got nothing else to ask me about after the presentation, you're welcome to ask me about that. So every good story starts with a good backstory. Okay, and the backstory here is call center volumes. Now this is the most boring slide in my deck, I can assure you, but this is where everything uh, starts in this tale. And what you'll see on the screen is about three and a half thousand calls per month are hitting this call center. This is for a large transactional banking system. And about 99% of these calls are in fact just people asking to have their password reset. And so it obviously makes sense to build a password reset function to take care of this. And in fact, this was the agile pilot on this large transactional banking uh, system. Now in the past, a password reset type feature would have taken about two to three years to deliver. Okay, so I used to manage the analysis team in this space, and we actually tracked in waterfall days how long features took to flow through. Two, it was actually two years to infinity uh, uh, how long features took to flow, flow through our system. And we were able to deliver password reset in six weeks. So this was fantastic. We had a nice big party back in the day where we could all touch the same food or in the same office with pizza and beer, and a couple of people got a boat trip to Mauritius as part of a corporate incentive scheme. Such was the success of Password Reset. Off the back of this, we went all in uh, uh, into Agile um, and uh, started our Agile transformation. You know, this Agile stuff works. So this was a fantastic success, or was it? Now, unfortunately, what you're looking at here is actually the after picture. This is about 18 months after that last slice of pizza was eaten and the last beer was drunk. And I was doing a conference talk actually at Agile Africa on feature hypotheses. I wanted to use this as an example. As far as I know, I was the first person who actually went to go and check those call center volumes. Um, so I did use this as an example in that conference talk, but in a completely different context. So we declared success, but obviously it wasn't. We delivered an output, we hadn't achieved the outcome, and no one seemed particularly bothered or faced. Uh, or realize that we hadn't actually achieved the intended outcome. Now, being a marathon runner, I thought very, this is actually very similar to celebrating getting to the start line of a marathon. The picture on the screen, incidentally, is the Comrades Ultra Marathon, the greatest, uh, the largest, the oldest ultra marathon on the planet. Every year, about 20,000 runners. But, and it's 90 kilometers, that's 56 miles for those who haven't upgraded to the metric system. Um, and about 90% of those runners will actually end up uh, finishing, uh, finishing the race. Um, now, to get to the start line of a marathon or the Comrades Marathon takes a lot of work. It's hard work. Okay. There's good stories behind it. Often as many years worth of training that's gone into that. So people have got good stories and how they got to the start line. But of course, nobody brags about actually getting to the start line. Okay, what do you brag about? What are you after? And obviously the answer is, you, we wanna earn our medals. And you only earn the medals when you cross the finish line. A lot of times when we're delivering features, products or services, we are giving ourselves the equivalent of a participation certificate. Okay, so we are rewarding ourselves for getting to the start line, but actually what really counts is when, once that production uh, starting gun fires, is how well do our features or our new products and services actually perform in a competitive environment. That is what really counts. So what is the organizational equivalent 
of participation trophies, ship it awards. Okay, and that's what we celebrated with, with, with our password reset. It was ready. Okay, that's what we were celebrating. Now you can see this is a tweet from Ron Kohavi at the end of 2014. We'll talk a bit more about Ronnie Kohavi later. Um, celebrating the fact that Microsoft had stopped, uh, stopped awarding doing shipping awards. And as he points out here, uh, not shipping is often better. And I'm sure many of us have been on the receiving end of uh, some Microsoft uh, products and services where not shipping would have, would in fact have been better. So shipping is not the goal. Shipping something useful to the customer is the goal. And if we don't focus on that, ship happens. Okay, so the true test of our software and our software changes, our new products, our new services is not that they're defect free and work according to spec, but rather that they achieve the expected benefit. So we need to ensure we're not measuring that they're ready, that we're getting them to the start line, but actually that they are earning their medals. That's what we've really got to try and evaluate and award. So I'd like you to consider now, what percentage of changes do you think result in value for your own organization? So just take a few seconds to ponder that. And the fine print there is, they need to be statistically significant beneficial results. So they need to stand up in a court of law, not just if you think that they had the right benefit or they were so obvious that they did, that there actually should be some data to back up your claims. Now, the answer for many people is, don't know. Okay, because we don't, we don't actually track it. Most organizations are not, are not uh, tracking it. Um, and if you are thinking it's greater than 50%, I'd love to see your data. So please share that with me afterwards if you do have that. What I can tell you is that at Microsoft, the percentage of changes that result in value is 33%, so one in three. And this is what they found. And in fact, this is on the experimentation platform. So these are really well thought out ideas done by clever people, which they feel have got, they've forced it out with other ideas and these are the ones that they think have got the best chance of success. Okay. So 33% is what you're looking at. Now, also maybe ponder for a second, what percentage of changes do you think will result in value in an optimized system, like a search engine, like uh, Microsoft Bing or Google Chrome? Just consider where you think it'd be about the same or slightly higher or slightly lower. The answer in this case, it's lower, it's significantly lower. Okay. So it's normally about 10 to 20%, probably closer to 10%. Um, is, is what, you, what you're going to be looking at as a success rate for optimized system. Now, the good news for most of us is that we are not working on optimized systems so that we can hopefully get that one in three chance, not the one in 10 uh, chance of an optimized system. Okay, so we're here to talk about Harry Potter today, but before we get into Harry, we need to talk about Harry's great mate in the books, Ron. In my story, it's not Ronald Weasley, it's Ron Kohavi, he of the aforementioned uh, tweet. Uh, and Ron Kohavi, let's just take a look at his credibility here. So he's worked Airbnb, Microsoft, and Amazon, nice, great companies to have in your CV. He's got a PhD from Stanford. He's actually one of the few PhDs who doesn't uh, put doctor in front of his name. Uh, his papers, over 40,000 citations, a highly credible uh, individual, a pioneer in the A-B testing world. And he also cemented his uh, name into uh, nerd culture by coining the term hippo, highest paid person's opinion with a, with a colleague of his uh, while at, whilst at Microsoft. So I first became aware of Ron Kohavi when I was reading the DevOps handbook. And it was almost a bit of a throwaway remark towards the end of a chapter. Um, the direct quote is on the screen there. And basically what it's saying is that they found it at Microsoft on the experimentation platform that only one in three changes actually was successful when you measured the outcome. Okay, so when you actually look at the outcome afterwards, these well thought ideas by clever people, you've got a one in three, best, best case scenario of a one in three chance of success. Okay, so only one out of every three changes will result in intended improvements. I call this Kohavi's law, okay? Quite simply, only one change in three will yield a positive result. The corollary to this is obviously the two out of three will have no detectable impact, or will in fact have a negative outcome. Um, what uh, Kohavi found was that actually one in three had no, just didn't change anything, but as to your legacy code, one in three would actually have the opposite effect, would actually make the system uh, worse. So nice quote there from him, evaluating ideas with controlled experiments was humbling. It showed how poor intuition and expert opinions are. So very often we rely on those. We think that they work well. The data shows that they don't. Uh, Kohavi's got another nice way of explaining this. He says, my job is to tell people that their babies are ugly. Okay, so they're great ideas, they're pet projects. Actually, they're not going to work in practice. People don't really want that. Now, 
in the books, of course, we've got Hermione. And I don't have Hermione in my story, but I do have Alice. Now, this is not Alice. This is a guy called Nigel Newton. But there are two strokes of good fortune here. The first is that Nigel Newton, he is the founder and the editor of Bloomsbury Publishing. At this stage, they were a small niche uh, uh, publishing, a London-based publishing house. And a few months beforehand, they decided to branch out into children's books. The other stroke of good fortune is that Nigel Newton had an eight-year-old daughter called Alice. And Nigel Newton had received a photocopy of the first three chapters of Harry Potter and the, and the Philosopher's Stone. Now, he's a busy guy. He hadn't had a chance to read it yet, but he did take it home one day. And after work, he gave it to his daughter, Alice, and said, yeah, take a look at this and, and let me know. Yeah, take a read and let me know what you think. Now, um, Nigel Newton is quite a recluse. He doesn't give many interviews. But here's a direct quote uh, from, from him for one of the few interviews he's done. Uh, this appeared in the, in, the, in the UK Independent. So she came down from a room an hour later, glowing, saying, Dad, this is so much better than anything else. She nagged and nagged me over the following months, wanting to see what came next. What I will also say about Nigel Newton, he's a man of remarkable resilience. I know if my daughters nag me, I will give in to their demands. I definitely won't hold out for a number of months before I give in to those, to those demands. Okay, so um, now only because little Alice Newton loved the book so much, had the good fortune of having a father who was a publisher. That was why Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone actually got, got, got published. So let's talk about Harry now. <clears throat> so at this stage, Harry Potter has been rejected by every major publisher and most of the minor publishers. It was only published because of the persistent pester power of an eight-year-old girl. The giant leap of faith that Bloomsbury took, well, not quite such a giant leap of faith, only 500 copies print first of a first print run, most of which actually went to schools and libraries. If you do own one of those first editions in good condition, it's worth about 100,000 pounds. Estimated worth, it goes into the billions of dollars of the Harry Potter franchise. And off the back of Harry Potter, Joanne Rowling, uh, the author, became the first and only billion dollar author and one of the very few self-made female billionaires uh, on, on, the, on the planet. And really what this highlights is just how poor our expert opinion, our experience and intuition are at predicting success. So if you think about publishers, they'll tell you that they know what sells. They read books for a living, but no one was willing to give Harry Potter a chance. Publishers will also tell you that every now and again, they'll go out on a limb. They've got a good feeling about this. Yeah, they'll take a hunch, take a flyer um, at, at, a, at, a, at a specific title, but no one was willing to do that with Harry Potter. And actually this happens quite often. I'm sure you can think of some other examples. Another famous one in the publishing world was Lord of the Rings. So J. Oral Tolkien's masterpiece also only got published because the son of Stanley Unwin, the publisher, really liked it. And, uh, and uh, that was how it got published. It also was rejected uh, countless times um, before uh, that, that, that uh, well-known um, uh, book got, got published. Right, so let's just do a quick test of your own ability to predict value. So you've got two search screens that are appearing on your screen. So you can look at the two. Now, what I'd like you to consider for a, for a minute is which one do you think will perform better? Obviously, the search engines that make money through click-throughs, which one of these do you think will get more click-throughs? Left, right, or a draw? No difference between the two. Now, what I can tell you is that there is a winner here. If I told you that the winner made a hundred million dollar difference on Microsoft bottom line, okay, that probably seems like a like a massive amount of money. I doubt anyone would have predicted that. Normally, when I run this in uh, uh, in training classes I do and other live conferences, there's normally a pretty even split between which people think which which one's going to win. So what I can tell you is this one on the left here. If you guess that one, you predicted cor cor correctly. Okay, I call this the Harry Potter of software changes. And the reason for that is, and this is actually just showing on the screen the, the, the difference or the change that happened, just moving some text, very innocuous change, moving some text okay, into the actual URL. Okay, I don't think any of us would have predicted that would make a hundred million dollar per annum difference on Microsoft bottom line. Now, this specific change sat on the backlog of Microsoft's experimentation platform for six months. 
Okay, so now these are people who are used to being wrong. They're used to getting things wrong because they know they've only got a one in three chance of success. But no one gave this specific change uh, any chance of actually making any difference, except for the developer who proposed it. So much so that he came in on the weekend, made the changes, they ran the, 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 the tests um, the, in the following week. The numbers were obviously off the scale, so much so that they thought that they'd broken the system. Okay, sometimes when you get results like that, it means no other search results are showing. So everyone's just clicking the ads because there's nothing else to click on. Okay, but this was this was something that they just stumbled uh, stumbled upon. Okay, so how can we find our own Harry Potter changes like this? So I've just got here uh, three spells from the the business value spell book. Why three? Well, that's all I've got time for. And also, if uh, Kahavi's law does hold true, at least one of these spells will hold some value for you, for you. So the first one we're going to look at is Akio Valorum, which means show me the value. But before we get there, I just want to throw out a warning that you've got to be very, very careful of the dark arts. The dark arts in this case is Akio Denario, show me the money. Okay. If you chase the money, it's unlikely that value will follow. If you chase value, money and funding invariably will follow. Okay, so be aware of the, of the dark arts. We wanna chase the value, not the money. There are different things. But just to highlight this, this is some, the pre-agile days. This is a, a team doing continuous improvement, doing small changes. These was kind of four page requirements documents that they were doing. And over two years, the stated benefits are in the hundreds of billions of rands. So that's still a lot of, that is a lot of money, even in, even in dollar terms. And after the fact, we tried to get actually, in fact, our business tried to get other business stakeholders who these changes were done to quantify the real value. Okay, so the actual RAND value, and no one was able to do so or were willing to do so. Okay, so this proven benefits were unknown. And invariably, that's the case. It's incredibly hard to prove because we're in complex environments, the cause and effect between direct revenue and changes that we do. Okay, so it's very, really, very really difficult to do so. So we tend not to. I personally have never in my entire career seen a business case proven. Never seen them disproven either. They're very, very hard to go either way. Now, just to maybe highlight this, this concept, why value, what the difference between value and money is if you consider a USB port inside your car, we've probably all got one, okay? We all probably use it to charge our devices, listen to our devices sometimes as well. Um, now, if you were comparing a couple of different cars and you're going to buy a new car, one of them didn't have a USB port and everything else was the same, you probably would say, well, I'm not going to buy that car. But if I had to ask you how much value would you attach to that? Very, very difficult to do so if you had to quantify. There's definitely value, but if you had to do it in rand or dollar terms, whatever your currency is, very, very difficult to go and do so. But there's definitely value for having that there. Okay. Cost is different to value as well. It's really easy to estimate cost, much, much harder to go and estimate value. So how do we estimate value? So a nice easy way of doing it is by using feature hypotheses. So you'll see here in our password reset example, a good feature hypothesis might be something like we want to reduce call center volumes by 90%. Okay, That's something that we can go and then check quite easily afterwards to see have we made a difference uh, on that. A bad hypothesis, an Akia denario chasing the money one, would be something like we want to save 800,000 rand a month. Now, incidentally, how do you think password reset came through? Like this one over here. And that's probably one of the reasons why no one bothered to check because it's so hard to go and prove that cost saving. There was a far higher likelihood that we would have gone and checked earlier if we were actually chasing reducing the call center volumes. So chase the value, not, not the money. And really what we want to ensure is that we're dealing with facts over fairy tales. Most business cases, most, if you're throwing out a financial term for a benefit, uh, it's going to tend to be a fairy tale and very, very difficult to go and prove whether you've got that benefit afterwards. So if you want fast turnaround, fast feedback, chase something that's tangible, easy to go and prove, take a true experimentation mindset. Our next spell is uh, one from the, from the classics. I'm sure all of us have heard of this as a kid, abracadabra. In this case, slightly calling it AB Cadabra. Okay, so obviously aligning there to, to some AB testing. So just a couple of examples. Um, this is from a very popular um, uh, online site in South Africa called Yappy Chef. And by simply removing the top header, the navigation header on their, on their um, wedding registry sign up, they increase the signups by 100%. 
Okay, now that might seem obvious after the fact. So probably what's happening is people like me would go there and they sell, sell very nice craft beer. And I might get there, oh yeah, I wonder if they've got any specials on craft beer and I get distracted and I never come back to the wedding registry. So sometimes less is more by taking it away. They doubled the signups uh, for, for, their, um, uh, for their wedding registry. Perhaps the most famous one out there is Google's 41 Shades of Blue. And um, uh, if you're not familiar with this, Google it. Okay, very interesting story. Most of us would have been part of a live experiment that Google did, deciding what shade of blue they would use for their URLs. And they eventually ended up on the, the dark bluish purple color. And what does this mean? 200 million per annum to that bottom line, just getting that color right. Okay, so they split up into about just over 2% groupings of all Google users, all Chrome users worldwide. And um, yeah, ran this experiment based on click-throughs. Yeah, pick the right color, $200 million per annum. Yeah, important to get those decisions right. I've got a couple of examples from, uh, from uh, Standard Bank. Uh, we've got a fantastic behavioral economics department who are doing some, some uh, really, really nice work in the space. So we've um, got a, a business as usual version of the banking app. Obviously, we want people to use the app more than to use manual processes, particularly in these days of COVID. So this was something that was run um, as part of trying to get people more into our digital platforms. So we changed, just really uh, changed the screen uh, using a few um, techniques here, social proof, loss aversion, and a call to action. And the end result of this, so we had a sample group, we had the, um, uh, the um, behavioral economics uh, experiment, and really what happened, the, the, the outcome of this, we increased 25% by the number of uh, downloads and installations uh, of the of the banking app, okay, of the digital uh, app, and ultimately what this is what this results in is an additional about thirteen point two million operating income uh, from this very very simple change uh, that was done. Okay, and we know that it works because we had a control group and we had the the, the change group. Um, so very very powerful, very very easy change. Uh, just in dollar terms, those of you uh, most most people won't be familiar with rand. That's about a million dollars. Okay, it's a million dollars. So it's still a significant amount, amount of money. Uh, just another example over here. So this was actually mailers that were sent out. We had a business as usual uh, version. Uh, we had then a couple of uh, three different uh, uh, um, three different versions, which were given to different uh, control, control groups using different uh, nudge techniques. Um, and the results you can see just basically built on each one. We had A, B, and C. C has got the most. Okay, A has got the least. What were the actual results here? Okay, well, B was the clear winner. Okay, so sometimes actually doing the right amount, not doing too much. B was the clear winner here. Um, this was for a, um, a revolving credit product, a loan, a loan product, increase in 172%. So a significant increase. Now, the interesting thing with this as well was actually in the loan balances was double, almost double that. Okay, 336%. In the, in the amount of loan balances, which is quite a surprising result. Ultimately, what this meant uh, means uh, for, for, for Standard Bank was um, uh, that's about uh, 64.3 million, that's about $4.5 million uh, um, increase in the balances um, and uh, operating inc income also significantly increased as well. Okay, off the back of once again, fairly simple changes. We know what works um, and obviously, yeah, that's made a, made a, a nice, a nice uh, change to, to the bottom line. And in fact, I even did some maybe testing for this talk. The first time I did this talk, I was torn between two titles, the Harry Potter one and the outcomes of a forgotten test case. So I put it out there on social media and to colleagues of mine and the overwhelming favorite was uh, Harry Potter, hence the title of this, of this, uh, this talk. Okay. And the last one we're gonna look at today is Specto Notio Excretum Maxim. Now, what does that mean? test a lot of ideas, okay? So if we consider that example I used earlier from Microsoft, they stumble across a Harry Potter change that's gonna make them $100 million once every five years. Microsoft runs 10,000 experiments a year, okay? It's actual figures. So in your organization, if you're just running 100 experiments a year, which is quite a lot for a lot of organizations, it's gonna take you 500 years to find your own Harry Potter change that's out there. So for most organizations, there's no short of a shortage of ideas, but the unfortunate reality is our Harry Potter ideas are still stuck under the stairwell in little whinging. We need to unleash them. So the final thought that I'd like to leave you with today 
is not the ideas that you implement, but the number of ideas that you are able to implement that will determine the long-term success of your business. Thanks very much for listening to me today. So what comes after the quest? Questions, of course. Um, there are a few links in this presentation that will be shared with you. So feel free to take a look, some, some great uh, other documents and further reading. My contact details are there. I'm always keen to uh, connect with people. So please hit me up. I'll uh, bring proponents of the follow back on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, so please keep in contact. And incidentally, if you're wondering about this specific uh, picture, just as lockdown struck, I did a home Ironman, my first tri triathlon. I did a full Ironman for charity. And I did it quite fun. So I ran several, uh, swam several hundred lengths in the pool, 180K cycle, uh, bike, bike ride. Um, I did have a Corona beer or two while I was uh, riding the bike. And my daughter, my, this is my youngest daughter, thought it would be a good idea that I read, read to her. And we were actually busy reading uh, Harry Potter at the time. So I'm busy reading Harry Potter to her while I'm busy with 180K uh, uh, bike, bike ride. Uh, before getting onto the hard part, which is which was running uh, 42 kilometers, 26 miles in the, in, the, in the driveway. Great. So thanks once again for listening to me and uh, looking forward to engaging further and to getting your questions uh, fr from you.